Hi, this is Mike Maloney, and I have a very special guest, Dan Larimer. Dan's mission is to secure life, liberty, property, and justice for all. How are you doing, Dan? Doing great. It's great to be on. Good. So this talk, we're going to cover sort of the future of freedom. Uh, my audience, some of them are very savvy, but some of my audience, uh, it doesn't really follow cryptocurrencies too much, but they've all heard of Bitcoin. Uh, and you were one of the original Bitcoin guys. There's actually uh, uh, postings where you are chatting with Satoshi Nakamoto, the creator of Bitcoin. And I believe you uh, actually pointed out some potential flaws in his system, didn't you? Yes, we, I was concerned about the scalability of, of Bitcoin and uh, Satoshi responded to me saying that uh, if I don't understand, he doesn't have time to explain it to me. <laughs> so I, uh, I went on and um, created three of the f highest performance blockchain uh, out there. Yeah, yeah. Um, so this conversation, we're going to cover freedom, liberty, voting, legacy government systems, uh, blockchain's role in redefining individual freedom, and uh, because... People don't realize that blockchains aren't just about cryptocurrencies. Everybody thinks blockchain means Bitcoin, and it doesn't. Uh, blockchains uh, are basically the future. Dan Rubach, my producer, director, uh, calls them the rails of the Internet, the future rails of the Internet. The Internet will run on uh, blockchain technology or something very similar, distributed ledger technology, uh, and it will secure the internet, commerce, legal, government, pretty much everything. Uh, what's your opinion on that? Well, <clears throat> blockchains give us a, a whole new way to add accountability to our, our database systems. Um, I've already said that they're the future of database. Um, and they, they do that by putting control in the user so that you actually have private keys for everything that you're signing. Uh, and those private keys are stored in your cell phone, uh, or I guess USB devices or, or various wallets. <clears throat> and what that means is that there's not a central database that can forge something you said. Uh, one of the examples I always give is uh, when someone posts something on Twitter, did they really post it? Or was it somebody that hacked their password or did a Twitter admin take over the account and post it as them? How do we actually know that these things are being said by uh, various people? Now, it might not matter for most people, but if you're Donald Trump or Elon Musk or any of these other folks, uh, then it becomes a very big problem, even for social media. Uh, to, how do we know that things are actually real and that they can't be tampered with uh, after the fact? Um, and, you know, ironically enough, just past month, Twitter had a whole bunch of accounts hacked by insiders uh, and they used it to do a Bitcoin scam. Um, so, uh, it's a very real problem, uh, and I think that blockchain is the solution to just make it all of our systems more secure. It also takes out the middlemen out of the process, right? Uh, yes, it can. Uh, blockchains can be used both for private, completely centralized systems and, and decentralized systems. The thing that makes them powerful in the decentralized sense is that it's actually a public record. Everyone has a copy of the database. Everyone can derive the state, um, which means that if you don't like the direction it's going, uh, the community always has the option of forking and launching a, another chain that follows the original rules or perhaps new rules. Um, and that freedom to fork is what actually provides the accountability. The transparency is what provides the decentralization. Um, <clears throat> and we saw that recently happen with the Steam blockchain. It was uh, taken over, attempted to move to the Tron chain. The community rejected it, forked the whole thing, and, and they continue with their blogging. So transparency and, um, and public key infrastructure is what gives blockchains the power to decentralize and to make sure that the people have options. Whereas if uh, Twitter or Facebook go rogue and they start going in a particular direction, no one can just fork them and create a new site with all the same user accounts, all the same content, uh, but controlled by new parties. That's just not possible with, with the centralized systems. Okay, for our viewers, uh, a lot of them may not know what a fork is, but 
if you've got something like uh, Bitcoin, for instance, the original, uh, and uh, there's a bunch of uh, participants that the, the miners, the people that run the programs, if they don't like a set of rules they, or a change that people are voting for, they can just make a copy and go off on, in their direction with their set of rules. Am I correct? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. So, um, uh, you know, I just want to give people a little bit more of your background. I see myself as a, uh, a I don't like the word freedom fighter. I want to be a freedom convincer, a uh, free, let me see, I had a great term for it a little while ago and now I don't. Persuader. <laughs> a freedom persuader, exactly. I want to be a freedom persuader. I view you as a freedom engineer. Uh, yes. You engineer systems that create freedom for all of the participants. And so uh, that's something that I find admirable, but I see us like playing on the same team here. <laughs> We're both trying for the same things. So um, you started the first decentralized blockchain financial product, BitShares. Uh, you created the first widely used blockchain product that felt like an ordinary website, Steemit. Uh, so people, when, when you're interacting with the website, you can't tell that this is on a distributed ledger. You created delegated proof of stake, which we're going to cover more of in a, a second, which is a consensus mechanism that's very fast and very efficient. I want to get into that efficiency. Uh, and then you put everything you, you learned, everything that you knew into EOS. Uh, and uh, recently you launched something called Voice. You, your company launched Voice, which is a decentralized blockchain-driven media platform. So um, getting into uh, delegated proof of stake, uh, just tell you, know, <clears throat> I first want to cover for, for the audience, people don't realize how inefficient Bitcoin is, and Bitcoin was the originator of blockchain, and so it's great but there's been tremendous strides, improvements in the meantime. And right now, uh, Bitcoin's energy consumption to create this consensus network, its energy consumption uh, is, uh, if, you, if, you, if it was a country, it would be number 43 in the world, uh, just consuming a little bit more than Switzerland and Kuwait. I mean, it's, it's extremely inefficient. The, uh, energy consumption for a single transaction, the footprint, is 573 kilowatt hours. And I'll tell you, I've, I've been driving Teslas since 2010, and uh, I can drive a long way on that much energy. This is a lot of energy. Yes, it so, is. Uh, tell us about uh, the delegated proof of stake, its efficiency, its speed, and its uh, safety. Sure. Well, the first thing that, uh, you know, I'm going to go way, way back to uh, another concept that I introduced to the space called a, a decentralized autonomous company, corporation, organization, right? They become the range of, of um, the entire space is uh, I viewed Bitcoin as basically shares in a, in a company. And I view the mining rewards, the, the Bitcoin that they issue to the people that are, uh, Baking blocks. Uh, yeah, the as, incentive that they that Bitcoin uses to get people to yeah. run these distributed ledgers all over the planet and make it right. uh, supposedly this safe, fair system. Right. So Bitcoin can be viewed as a company that issues shares Bitcoin uh, to people who who burn electricity. The more electricity you're willing to burn, the more shares it's it's issuing, uh, and then uh, it's it's uh, governing the the company according to how much electricity you're burning on any given day. Uh, and that's, um, and that's all, uh, I guess the miners, these are the people that are using electricity to create the Bitcoin blocks. They collaborate into mining pools. Now mining pools kind of like, you know, you've got your computer running mining and then you join a pool so you can actually get more consistent income. Uh, and so that's kind of like a, um, a, voting proxy in a company and, and all the shareholders, the people that own the computers doing the mining, go to those proxies and then you've got like 
three proxies that have a 51% control of Bitcoin. Uh, <clears throat> but with delegated proof of stake, I said, well, why don't we just take all the lessons we learned about how corporate governance can operate, where you've got shareholders, shareholders can delegate their votes to proxies, and then they can elect a board of directors and implement that on a, on a blockchain uh, where the top people that are elected take turns producing a block. Uh, it's got all the exact same mechanics of, uh, you know, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of individual people delegating their vote, which is the, uh, to people either voting for the block producers directly or indirectly. Uh, and now you've got a group of, say, 21 people, each of which has an equal stake in producing a block. So you've got more decentralization. Uh, and because you know who these um, people are, the algorithm can actually be uh, much faster. Bitcoin produces one block every 10 minutes. Ethereum does it every 15 or so seconds. EOS does it every half second. So there's massive difference in the latency. Uh, and that's absolutely necessary if you're trying to build uh, applications that feel uh, just as competitive as the centralized alternatives, whether it's an exchange or a social media platform. Yeah, I've uh, had Bitcoin transactions before that took uh, hours actually to uh, settle because you're supposed to wait for it to get buried behind so many blocks to make sure that a fork hasn't happened or whatever, uh, to make sure it's permanent. Uh, and uh, there are new systems out there, uh, EOS among them, that uh, uh, get this permanency immediately. You're currently, uh, isn't EOS like processing uh, a majority of the, uh, well, they're not all transactions because blockchain can record pretty much anything that can be written in computer code, including video and uh, voice information. Am I correct? Um, it can record any data. Uh, uh -huh. the, the magic of blockchain is that it records the intent, intent of people um, and then you can derive whatever state you want from it. So for example, on social media, I can say, here's my post. If it's a tweet, you can put that on the blockchain. But if it's a video file, you can put um, a hash, which is a, a, like a fingerprint of the file. So everyone says that this is, they know this is the file you wanted. And if they can have a copy of it, they can verify that they're the same. Um, but it allows you to have authenticity and verification of data. So right now, EOS is actually making more recordings, the, the blocks, than... Uh, the all of the other cryptocurrencies combined. Am I correct? Uh, I'd have to check blocktivity.info, which tracks these things in real time. But yes, it has been. I'm on there right now. And, <laughs> and uh, when I click on uh, all of the, they've, they've got, uh, you can compare all of the major uh, cryptocurrencies. And I've got them all clicked and it shows EOS as doing 78.7% .7 of all the processing out yep. there. And uh, let me see what um, Bitcoin, actually it doesn't even show up, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so so for, for, for perspective, it's uh, 68 million uh, actions a day on EOS and 757,000 uh -huh. actions a day. So it's about uh, 70 times the tran daily transactions of Bitcoin. And Bitcoin has no room to grow. EOS is using a fraction of its capacity. Yeah, and um, uh, Bitcoin is 80%, uh, roughly 80% of the market capitalization of all of these uh, cryptos, 75%, yeah. something like that. Uh, EOS is less than two. Uh, this, uh, you don't know this, but EOS is actually my uh, largest investment in cryptocurrencies. Oh, wow. <laughs> no pressure oh. on my part. <laughs> you know, it's, it's interesting, um, the different cryptocurrencies. You've got the technology, uh, but you also have, I guess, um, brand. And Bitcoin's got this brand that is almost, uh, you know, almost more important from a money perspective than the technology. The technology, you can build um, all kinds of things on it. Uh, and um, so if you, if you want to build 
a monetary system, you know, technology is key. But, it, you know, there's old technologies like gold and silver that also are great for money. Um, but, you know, no one's going to say that one thing replaces another. They're all fitting different niches. So if you want programmable money, EOS is the place you can go because Bitcoin is not programmable anywhere near <laughs> Uh, as much as explain as programmable money to the audience because uh, they don't understand that you can do things like create your own escrow. Uh, there's there's a whole bunch of things that you can do uh, with some. <clears throat> the reason uh, uh, EOS is my uh, largest investment in cryptos uh, is because it can do almost everything that any of the other cryptos can do, but many of those cryptos are limited to a specific function or a set of specific functions. Uh, yeah. and so I just think that there is a, a huge future in only a few cryptos. And I think there, you know, because there's thousands upon thousands of them, you can't keep up with it anymore. Exactly. Uh, it's a real problem. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the, most of them are going, the vast majority are probably going to go to zero. Uh, just because there are so many, and some of them are deficient in design and don't have the ability uh, to constantly evolve either. Um, yeah, so, so, so there's a number of different factors you've got to look at when you're evaluating the cryptocurrencies. The community, the technology, the governance, the adaptability. Uh, so EOS is designed to be a, a governed blockchain because we've got delegated proof of stake it's possible to reach consensus and upgrade it, whereas Bitcoin is basically stagnant. It's not going anywhere. Now, those are two completely different value propositions. Some things like money, you don't want people changing that willy-nilly because then you end up with things like the Federal Reserve. But other things uh, where you need to adapt with the changing times uh, and respond quickly, uh, particularly with things that are programmable because you know, there's always going to be bugs. And when there's bugs, what do you do? How do you recover? Uh, and so they're like, they're both filling different niches. And so EOS's strength is the ability to combine governance, combine high performance, uh, and the ability to have anyone who wants to can deploy code onto the blockchain to implement uh, exchanges, you know, like you said, escrows, auctions, um, you know, games or insurance plans or social media. Um, there's all kinds of things that people can do and it's programming your money. Uh, and that is an incredibly powerful. Uh, Let me just uh, um, emphasize this for the audience. You could buy a house with a cryptocurrency that is programmable and uh, you could select a third party that has to verify or a number of parties that have to verify that, that a certain number of criteria have been met before. So you would be able to put up the currency, but the party that you're buying from doesn't get that currency until a whole bunch of criteria are met. And when yep. third parties verify that that criteria has been met, then the transaction happens. But because it's in escrow, you don't have it anymore. So the selling party can trust that you're, you've got skin in the game going to complete this transaction. Yep. So uh, that's just an explanation of escrow. And Dan just went through a whole list of, of other features that you can program into a cryptocurrency that you can't do with euros or, or dollars or yen or, or yuan or Correct. pounds or whatever. Correct. Yeah. Well, and there's, so there's several things here uh, when it comes to to programming things into cryptocurrency. It's really come, also comes into like the transparency aspect of it. But uh, before I get there, I want to highlight that it's possible to move Bitcoin uh, onto the EOS network. In fact, you could create an entire Bitcoin client inside a smart contract. Uh, just like we can run all of uh, Ethereum, which is another uh, um, blockchain. We can run their smart contracts emulated in EOS faster than they can be run on Ethereum itself, right? So uh, we, we can both emulate these chains and move their currencies on there. What that means is that in the future, Bitcoin is going to live on the EOS network and they're going to be uh, transacting on exchanges and smart contracts and doing all these things, uh, trading against EOS natively um, 
Uh, and that is, that's the power of having a programmable high performance chain is that you can kind of become the hub of all activity across all the other chains because you got fast settlement and decentralization uh, in one spot. So I, I really see that that is a, a future for, for EOS. Okay. Um, you know, very recently, there's been more and more stories about central banks uh, getting involved in, uh, well, they call it digital currency because they don't want to call it cryptocurrency. Uh, mm -hmm. But basically, it would be blockchain-driven uh, central bank currencies. And, you know, I've got a story in front of me here. Fed's direct money transfers are coming, says Brainerd. Uh, Brainerd is a Fed governor. Um, Fed collaborating with MIT on hypothetical digital currency. And then just uh, recently, there was a video released by the IMS promoting digital, uh, promoting cryptocurrency. And, how, and, and all of the benefits. So we're getting ready for this. Do you see this? How do you see this? Is this a good thing or is this a bad thing? I think it's a, a bad thing. And I, I think that blockchain technology is actually um, neutral to, to goodness or badness. Uh, you can use it to implement a Ponzi scheme uh, and you can use it to implement a 100% reserve uh, bank with integrity. Uh, and when the Fed moves their ledger onto a blockchain, they still have the power to control uh, and enforce negative interest rates or whatever other crazy inflationary scheme. They can freeze your account. Right? Bitcoin was created so that people who the banking system wants to cancel have a way of transacting outside the system uh, and can do so internationally. But uh, when the central banks come and they propose a system, they're not proposing a system that they can't control. Um, and that is a night and day difference. They're also not proposing a system that's free from uh, their ability to print endless amounts of money or to completely change all the rules. Now, my, my mission is to create voluntary solutions, free market solutions for securing life, liberty, and property. Uh, and that actually means that people have to be independent. We need to remove our dependence on the system. So when you're dependent upon the Federal Reserve or a central bank and they control all the money, you're, you're, you don't have freedom. It's impossible to have freedom while you're dependent upon one entity. And that's the beauty of things like gold and silver is that when you have them in your physical possession, uh, you're, it's no one else's liability and it's not dependent upon any technology. It can go thousands of years and it'll still be there. But even even so, it's still just a consensus um, or a consensus of, among people that this thing is scarce and we're going to use it as a, a means of uh, exchange and account. In some ways, Bitcoin and EOS are, um, have more integrity than gold and silver because it's easier to authenticate the integrity of Bitcoin than it is of gold. You know, we recently found all these tungsten uh, or fake gold bars that have been traded like billions and billions of, of fake gold. And it's and all the hassles of dealing with the physical metals mean that people end up having to trust banks, which then create fractional reserve systems and, and basically turn gold into a promise for gold, which is not the same thing. Uh, and, and then fraud occurs and, and basically you have the whole evolution of how we've got from gold coins circulating to where we are today. Um, and Bitcoin and, and cryptocurrency say, well, hey, the rules are there. Everyone can see it. Uh, mm -hmm. It can't be counterfeited. Unfortunately, the Achilles heel of all these decentralized blockchain technologies is the Internet itself. It is the dependence upon the infrastructure that increasingly governments are taking over. Um, and if you can't, uh, you know, if there's an EMP, bam, your money is gone. If uh, there's hyperinflation and the uh, you know, people starting to steal copper from all the wires to figure out how to survive. Internet goes down. You're not being able to transact with your with your Bitcoin or EOS. So it's it's, it's this balance between currencies that work well when everything's um, operating and we've got this techno technological world with functioning internet and relative stability. And then there's things that work well, you know, when there's there's chaos and and you need the mixture of the both. So I, I see 
Bitcoin and EOS as the currencies of the future and gold and silver as, as the money uh, that, that is the fallback when all else fails. That's the reason I've bet on both. Uh, I was the first dealer to start accepting crypto, the first precious metals dealer to start accepting cryptocurrencies. And I, you know, I should give people uh, just a, a little recap on my background with cryptocurrencies because I don't talk about them that often. Uh, you know, my uh, background is precious metals, monetary history, economics, and, uh, and so I focus on those things. But I was introduced to crypto, to Bitcoin by Trace Mayer. You probably know Trace, right? Yeah. And um, he actually came to my house, I think in 2010. I think Bitcoin was below a dollar then. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and tried to get me into it. And then he came back in 2011 and tried to get me into it. It was still below 10 bucks. And this was back when you could plug a computer into the wall and start mining, just any computer. And you would yep. actually every once in a while win some bitcoins. And then he came to my office when it was uh, still below 100 bucks an ounce in 2012 or whatever. Uh, and he kept on trying to get me into this. And I finally, in 2014, he got me to uh, go to a Bitcoin conference, a crypto conference called Bitcoin on the Beltway in Washington, D.C., where I bought my first bitcoins. And, and it's in uh, my I made a documentary on it, uh, episode eight of Hidden Secrets of Money. And uh, I went back and announced to my insiders that I was going to put 10, my insiders are uh, people that have um, purchased a certain amount of precious metals uh, from goldsilver.com. And I announced that I was going to put up to 10% of my portfolio in it. Uh, then in 2017, when Bitcoin was peaking, uh, I think the week before it peaked, I took some profits and I bought some of Bitcoin. Uh, and bought some silver with it. I also bought EOS in 2017 and uh, a few other uh, cryptocurrencies. And I released the uh, documentary, I think just a day or two before Bitcoin peaked in 2017. Uh, and uh, we, we had learned about a new technology called Hashgraph, which uh, has speed and uh, is, is uh, quite versatile, such as EOS is. And I, I made a, an investment in that, not nearly what I put into EOS, however. <laughs> and uh, and uh, then, uh, you know, uh, since then, I've been in it, but I still uh, lean heavily toward gold. I'm, you know, going to be 65 shortly. And uh, I, I just came from a different era. I know that uh, today, uh, people uh, trust virtual assets, and uh, and its virtual assets may as well be real assets to them. But as you said, uh, it does have a reliance on the internet for settlement. So I've got both. I've got something that uh, does not rely on the internet. And when you talked about um, all of the games in precious metals that go on, such as all the paper gold that exists, and then yeah, there was some counterfeit uh, tungsten bars out there. I'm sort of betting on those. I have, uh, m most of my gold is either in my possession, I, I'm mostly in silver actually, but it's in my possession or it's at Brink's security in uh, an account that I have there uh, that I opened through my, you know, I was the first precious metals dealer to start opening third party storage accounts for people. Uh, and uh, made a deal with Brinks. When it goes through Brinks, it gets assayed. And so when everything remains in the vaulting system like that, it's much safer than stuff that's going in and out. So when you've got something that, that came from a refinery uh, and then went directly to the vault, you pretty much know that it's real. And as the paper games start to implode, uh, and, uh, and if there is more of this uh, counterfeit uh, stuff out there, then that raises the value of the real stuff that you have. So, uh, and we're seeing a whole lot of stress on that system right now, with uh, deliveries at the commodities exchanges and such. So um, to get back to uh, blockchain, the pur purpose of blockchain governance is to make decisions this is something that you wrote, I believe. 
The purpose of blockchain governance is to make decisions that, uh, in the best interest of as many people as possible, while minimizing the opportunity for a small group of people to act in ways that benefit themselves at the expense of the community. Uh, give our viewers a little bit deeper dive into that. You know, I've done a lot of census work in, in blockchain and, and focused a lot on, on the technology. But at the end of the day, consensus is a, is a human process. And, uh, and governance, you know, my, my ideal vision is create an alternative government that is voluntary, nonviolent, but so powerful that it can actually rein in existing government. Like no one would want to work for the IRS because you'd be in bad standing with this new parallel government that's completely nonviolent. Uh, that's the kind of uh, system and incentives that I'm, I'm striving for, where no one wants to go to the government courts because, you know, they're corrupt. But this parallel court system, it renders a judgment, whether it's arbitration or whatnot. And if you don't comply, you're basically uh, cut off. Uh, but I figure what I, what I realized is that peace in society is, is dependent upon the people being able to reach consensus. If, and the way that dictators control things is that they take control of an existing consensus mechanism, in which case, you know, we've got the Constitution and the two-party system. And, and so forth. And that's our consensus system on who's president, who gets to make the laws and what everyone follows. Uh, they take control of it and then they undermine the ability of people to reach a new alternative consensus, right? They prevent society from forking. Uh, and so even though 70% of people for the past 50 years uh, disapprove of how Congress is doing, we have been unable to change things. We have a captured, broken, consensus algorithm. So one of the things I hope to achieve is to introduce a new means of bringing people together to actually reach consensus. Because if we can't come together, right, if we can't live together, we're going to die alone. Uh, and, you know, we're starting to see this with the civil unrest and, and everything going on is, you know, everything's getting more and more polarized and people are getting violent. And it's because our consensus system of society has been hijacked by the Federal Reserve ability to print unlimited money to fund special interest to grow media control the message and so you know combination of propaganda and censorship is being used to divide and conquer and prevent society from reaching consensus on any other leadership other than dumb and dumber or bad and worse right those are those are the choices we have these days uh, when it comes to to governance. And so, you know, we really need a new way of reaching consensus. And so that's, that's what I spent a lot of my time thinking about. And that's why I got into blockchain, because I saw it as a means of creating a transparent ledger upon which we can define rules of consensus and everyone can, can validate that this is the new consensus. Yeah, you've uh, touched on uh, the next topic that I was uh, going to, I was uh, sort of finishing up with EOS here, uh, because, but you've gotten in to not just governance, but government. And uh, uh, EOS has a user agreement that you used to call a constitution. Uh, very simple, a set of rules that people can read and all agree to that these are the rules of the space that they're going to live in when they're uh, dealing with people in this community. Uh, mm -hmm. um, you know, before we uh, get on to uh, freedom and government, uh, can we go back just for a second? And uh, the system, it, it's free transactions and they're paid for by, by a very small uh, form of inflation uh, versus uh, having a, and that makes it something that people want to use because it's free and it's super fast. Uh, Yep. And then, uh, what are the so what are the benefits of free transactions paid for via inflation, and what are the benefits of a platform like Voice? <clears throat> All right, so let's let's start with just the let's start with EOS because EOS and Voice do things slightly differently. Um, on EOS, the idea of free transactions things have to appear to be free because every micro transaction, even if it's for a tenth of a penny has this cognitive load on it 
uh, you're, you're actually spending money and the system has to do all the accounting for actually spending money, uh, not to mention potential tax consequences, <laughs> the environment that we're in. So uh, for having a really good user experience, people don't want to be nickel and dimed on every little thing that they do. They want to use a system and transact. You don't want to pay a fee when you update your password. You don't want to pay a fee when you change your profile, right? It, it's just, there's this psychological aspect to usability that means that you want the appearance of free transactions. In reality, nothing in life is free. Somebody is always paying for things, right? So you always have to ask yourself, all right, who's paying for it? Why are they paying for it? Uh, and, and what is the true cost? So when we launched EOS, the idea was it's, it's sort of like um, a gym membership. Yeah, you, you stake your EOS and you can use the net. If you have 1% of the EOS, you can use 1% of the capacity of the network for all time. Um, and then more recently, we added the ability to say, hey, if you've got, you know, 1% of the EOS, but you're not needing, uh, you know, to do hundreds of transactions a second forever, you can actually lease your your EOS to other people who can then use your transaction volume. Uh, and, and that's when we introduced the resource exchange. Um, and that allows you to effectively pay uh, a small monthly rental fee and get a large number of transactions, right? The cost of transacting on EOS is orders of magnitude, you know, 100 times less than tra transacting on other blockchains out there. So much so that it's practically free. And because you can take your staked EOS, lend it to the RECs and earn interest on it effectively, uh, earn a, a share of the fee rental fees, uh, it kind of makes it free, right? It's like uh, having a house that you're renting, generating income, allows you to go rent a house from somewhere. You get, you get use of the house for free. Um, so that's how we created an environment uh, that really makes things usable. And this was actually invented originally on Steam. So when I was creating a social media platform, no one wants to pay even a fraction of a cent for every comment or like or upvote. Uh, and then we took that concept, we brought it to EOS uh, and, and we generalized it. So that's, that's what the uh, resource model is on EOS. So um, where all of the other social media platforms are basically, their revenue comes from using your data. Uh, they're basically mining you where yes. on, on these platforms, uh, you have a system where you can, uh, the, the system gets rewarded and you get rewarded at the same time, making it a, a zero cost for you without marketing your data and without you being the resource that's being mined. Yeah, effectively. Yes. Awesome. Do you have a patent on verifying the identity of somebody that somebody is actually a human and not a bot and that somebody uh, can't uh, make a whole bunch of accounts so that they can scam a system and uh, uh, try and tilt the odds in their favor by uh, so what tell it tell us about this tell us about patent on identity all right so you know as we were creating voice one of the concepts there is that we wanted to have unique users so that we could give every unique user effectively a, a basic income. Uh, and I've got a whole economic theory of how that's consistent with libertarian principles uh, and, and not stealing money from people. But the idea of a unique verified person is actually critical for all democratic processes. Uh, and the best we have today is trying to tie things to your government ID. But that completely centralizes control uh, in the hands of, of the government and the issuer of, of these IDs. And they have, they have these massive databases and they can basically create as many IDs as they want, which they do for all their secret agents, I'm sure. So uh, I created a system that uh, effectively would have two people get together and take a picture together. And when you take a picture with someone, you establish that uh, these two people at, at the same time time and place. And by using the technology on your phone, uh, you can verify uh, that you actually were indeed at that time and place because my phone can prove that it was 
next to your phone using uh, speed of light communication, right? They can only be so far apart before the latency start uh, expanding. So I can prove the two phones are next to each other. I can prove with the camera and face ID and uh, other things that you were there with your phone, right? Because you got the biometrics there. And, and we can do this over time. So it's not just a one-time thing. Uh, so you can, and that kind of builds this graph, uh, which gives you very strong uh, evidence of uniqueness, uh, very high cost of reproducing. Because that's what your identity is. It's really your position in the social graph relative to everyone else. And how can we establish that in a decentralized way? And so it's a, that's in general what the patent covers, using a phone to capture data, potentially video of you with other people, and then doing it over time, combining with some other cryptographic attestations and things like that. And now everyone in the world can look at this public record and say, yes, I've got a high degree of confidence that all of these different actors are are unique to with some measure of, of uniqueness. Um, and that could be a fundamental building block that uh, prediction markets or voting systems, whatnot can do. I also have uh, a patent on uh, cryptographically uh, provably honest elections. Elections where every single person, if they wanted to, could write their own client, write their own software, to cast their own ballot and to uh, verify the results of the election. Uh, un unfortunately, provably honest elections are actually illegal. <laughs> <laughs> Explain that. Honest elections are actually illegal. Um, the requirements they put on elections uh, around the concept of secret ballot prohibits you from having any information that would allow you to verify that your uh, ballot was cast as you intended and counted as cast. Uh, so they... Uh, even if it's secret, like no one else but you knows knows what your vote was and can uh, can tie it back to you. you can, so you still have privacy over your vote, but if you have the ability to prove to yourself that your vote was counted, uh, that's that's actually not allowed in the election systems. Wow. Um, and and so as a result, it's it's uh, it's basically we have logical proof that's impossible to build a, a provably honest election system. Uh, under the current rules under the current rules but hopefully you'll change them <laughs> I, you know we, we have to build a parallel system uh, but yes right. absolutely um so i i don't know if we covered this what is DeFi? yes DeFi is decentralized financial uh system that's kind of what BitShares was this, this okay. first decentralized financial platform it's the idea of using smart contracts on blockchains like eos for building insurance for building bonds for building options basically the entire financial system on a blockchain uh, and decentralized. That's the concept of DeFi. That's sort of what EOS was built for. Wow. Okay, um, I have to say that I do admire your level of disrespect for the Federal Reserve, your level of contempt. It's, it's a, <laughs> this is a healthy thing, I think. Uh, you, it, back in March, you uh, did a tweet that says, running out of toilet paper, question mark? Try your local ATM. <laughs> but yes. On the subject of uh, tweets, uh, you have taken on um, several different uh, issues. And I want to uh, read a tweet from August uh, 17th. Can any system of governance govern an immoral population with integrity? And the system that I'm talking about, you wrote a brilliant article recently on uh, hierarchical, say, tell us what you call yeah. it. Ra yeah. Randomized? It's randomized hierarchical rep rep representative government. Yes. This is the most brilliant system. It, it, it takes away all the power from special interests, from the media, from uh, the incumbents that are already in the government. Uh, and it, it is a way that we could come up with uh, the way you've got it laid out. Uh, 80% of the population, right now, what, what is the approval of government? Uh, the, the populations of most uh, countries in the world, how much do they approve of their government and how do we end up with the worst of the worst? The, you, know, <laughs> you look at the, every time we elect somebody, I'm going, oh my 
God, how could this be true? Yeah, dumb and dumber. That, that's worse and yes. sad. Bad and worse. Those are the options we have. Uh, it's it's a it, it's a symptom of attempting to. Uh, how do you scale decision making? Is is actually the problem, right? And so what we have is uh, somebody decides who the choices are, and then we all get to vote on on who those choices are. And it's sort of like Henry Ford, you can have any color car you want as long as it's black. It's not really a choice anymore, right? We have the, these two political parties, uh, which, um, you know, it's, it's, there's all kinds of papers that demonstrate that when you have a, a voting system, we have two parties naturally form uh, and, they, and they get polarized <clears throat> and they can't possibly have any principles because they're coalitions of large groups of people that aren't based on principles. Uh, and then <clears throat> these parties become the government. It doesn't matter what um, the Constitution says about, you know, 300, you know, how many representatives and senators and things like that, because all those people are members of parties and the parties are governed by a different power structure uh, where they set all the rules and where they change the rules anytime someone like a Ron Paul or a Bernie Sanders challenges the desires of the party leaders. Um, and that means we, we have a, a binary choice uh, between, and we don't even, it's, it's a false choice. And, and that's the problem in the United States. Uh, and, and so- The problem we, in most countries. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so it's the illusion- And, that and, we are and in the rest of the controlled. countries, uh, it's, it's a different problem, but it's a worse problem. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, exactly. This is the best of the worst is what we're stuck with right now. And you've come up with an alternative. To that. I, I can describe that process real quick and then I can get back into like some of the yeah, philosophy please. that goes into it. Because everything I do is, is based on first principles and philosophy and building blocks here. So <clears throat> um, the idea is you randomly divide the population into groups of, of 10 people. Each group of 10 people has to deliberate amongst themselves who from within their group is going to represent them? That person, and then they have to agree by two thirds majority. <clears throat> that person then represents them at the next level. You take all the representatives, uh, randomly assign them to groups of 10 and make them come to an agreement of which of those representatives will represent them at the next level. And with eight or so levels, you can reach consensus among a hundred million people. Uh, but here's, here's why it's so great. Uh, there are no, there's no campaigning because the only people you can vote for are the people in your group that you're talking to. Uh, the, the nine other if, people in your group that you're talking to on video conferencing and stuff on, on right. It can be, it can be a zoom whatever. call. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Or in, in your web browser, or it can be in-person meetups. Right. I, I've, I've got an entire, uh, I've been working on how to do this low tech, not, not a high tech process because, because for a system to work well, it has to work. You, know, you have to be able to implement it in 1800s as well as today. But one of the, the challenges is, let's say you wanted to uh, fix the world. Uh, let's, say you're, let's say you're the wisest man around, you're at your Socrates, and, and you've, got this, you've got the solution, and you, you run with it. You're not going to get elected, right? Because most people haven't had the time to study and become an expert in the fairest possible system. And if you did get elected and you were made dictator for a time, eventually you're going to be replaced by some other dictator. Uh, that's going to be the worst possible person you can conceive. So we need a way of, of you, you can't win or, or introduce a platform that's got a whole bunch of ideas that people can disagree with. You've got to start by introducing a process on how we're going to make decisions, right? You have to say, well, there's going to be disputes. We're going to agree that there's going to be disputes. That's self-evident. How are we going to resolve those disputes among us? In the past, we said, we're going to have democracy. We're going to elect candidates, and that's how we're going to reach consensus, and that's going to be perceived as fair. And so uh, the Constitution and the, our governance system, that is our dispute resolution process between the Republicans and Democrats and hypothetically, a bunch of smaller minority parties. But that system's not working anymore, right? We're realizing that, wait, the judge, the game's rigged. 
it's not actually resolving our disputes. And so now we're, we're starting to see all these riots and everything else, um, which means the solution has to start at, with a very, very simple idea, something that everyone can get behind. And, and the idea that is almost universal today is, hey, democracy, right? It's the worst form of government except for everything else. Now, the idea of democracy is that every individual is a unique person, uh, a, a unique, is intrinsically valuable, right? Uh, and therefore, they should have equal weight regardless of everything else. You know, they should have input into the system. Uh, the idea that government legitimacy comes from consent of the governed, and to some sense, if you've got a democratic process, you've established that there's consent. What are you consenting to? You're consenting to the democratic process. But not all democracies are equal. A democracy that gives you a false choice or that gives power to the media or power to incumbents or all these different things is taking the, the consensus that, hey, we all, I consent to democracy and, and turn it into, I cons I'm consenting to a game that's rigged. And all, then people want to pull their, pull their consent back from that. Um, so the idea is, come up with something very, very simple that people can get behind. And two, you have to say, how, do, how can I guarantee that this system is not going to devolve into something that's corrupt as best as we can predict? Um, so that's when I came up with um, randomized hierarchical representative voting. The, the randomization is important because it prevents people from organizing into parties, right? It creates a a statistical sampling of the population in each group. So if, this, if the population is theoretically half Republican and half Democrat, each group is going to be approximately half Republican, half Democrat. Some groups might be 80-20. You know, occasionally, there might be a group that's all one or all the other way. That's the nature of randomness. But each group has to come to a consensus, and they can actually have discussions and talk about their principles and come to a consensus. Which one of them is best to represent them at the next level up. Uh, and if they can't come to the consensus, that group's opinion is basically defaulting to the consensus everyone else's reaches. So you know, there's a lot of incentive to come to a consensus on a representative, whereas today's system is very polarizing. There's no incentive to come to consensus. And instead, they appeal to their base and they try to get that 51% so they can roll over the 49. Um, and, and so randomization is a critical component. It's also a critical component uh, and of you, nature. Could, you could write this into, into code, or you could just put a bunch of names into a hopper and spin that around and pick out 10 names, right? <laughs> yes, yeah. yes. You can, the, the system I, I, I'm proposing uses a, a deck of playing cards, right? Huh. And, and you, you, you hand out the cards and you just group people. Uh, you know, everyone's got the same suit or everyone's got the same, uh, same face, same number on it. Uh, that's a way of doing it in small groups, and then you just repeat it hierarchically, and, and it, it scales. Uh, and th there's also some like information theory built into this. When when you have a candidate running, uh, it doesn't scale from a computer science sense. It's everyone has to evaluate all the facts and and the candidate and try to figure out are, are they the right candidate. There's too many choices. There's too much information, um, and and your voice and your input is is relatively small compared to the whole. So there's a concept called rational ignorance, where the cost of doing the research necessary to cast a valid vote is higher than the benefit that you get, than the impact your vote has on the whole. And so therefore, people are rationally ignorant. Uh, and, wow. um, you know, just the just cost benefit of, of responsible voting is not there. So most votes contain no information whatsoever. Uh, other than they're just people uh, responding emotionally to the news of the day. Uh, but there's no way that they could actually process it. But when you're in a group... Yeah, of we tend to pick candidates that uh, are semi-good looking and can at least string together two words without putting their foot in their mouth. <laughs> and, and, and even that is questionable these days. <laughs> <laughs> Keep on going. I'm sorry I interrupted. <laughs> um. But when, you, when you're in groups of 10, you can actually have a discussion. You can use the Satoric method to persuade people in the group. And, and the, best, you know, 
the best rise of in each group. Um, so imagine if in our debates, right? You have a stage and you've got ten candidates uh, for for nomination. Imagine if they had to select among themselves who their who the leader was, and if they weren't trying to persuade all the other voters, you're not going to have appeal to the base emotions of society and things like that. You're trying to persuade other people that are seeking the presidency to support you instead of them, to yield. Uh, and, and, and it's much richer. You're dealing with much smarter people because in order to persuade, the, you know, 10 random citizens or nine random citizens, the next level up, you have to persuade 10 citizens that were able to persuade 10 others. At the next level up, you have to persuade 10 people that were able to persuade 100 others or the representative of 100 others. And so it's kind of like a playoff where your skill at being persuasive, at representing a group, a small group that you can actually talk to, is what allows you to advance. And so in theory, you should have articulate, persuasive, intelligent people emerging at the top and not people that can uh, tell people what they want to hear and, and play off of the masses um, and, and, and persuade people who don't have the time to actually do the research to find out those things. So it's, it's a very, very different dynamic that in theory should allow us to identify the best and the brightest. Um, and there's another aspect of this. Um, you know, we talk about constitutions. Uh, you know, the, the idea of the constitution is supposed to limit the power of government. But as uh, Spooner said, either the constitution we have authorizes the government that we have, or it's been powerful, uh, powerless to prevent it. Uh, in reality, the nature of government depends on the people in the government, the people running it. You can have a totalitarian dictator with libertarian ideals and get a very different society than the same dictator with Marxist ideals, right? Uh, but then you have to play this game over multiple generations. And so we know that you know, having dictators eventually fails. Even if you start out with a good one, eventually you get the bad one. Uh, <clears throat> so you, we need to have this dynamic self-correcting process. And the thing that needs to be preserved is the people's ability to change who's in power. And people need to agree in the principle of this is the process that we use for determining the legitimacy of who's in power. And just like today, if, if elections were canceled, people would immediately reject the legitimacy of whatever is going on. But hold an election, even if it's completely corrupt, and people say, well, I can't prove it's corrupt, so I guess I'm going to, to kind of lead it. And it creates this ambiguity that there is no who is the real leader if you don't have an election, uh, who's legitimate. Uh, and then it has to be enforced by force, you know, and it just devolves. But if people can say, hey, follow this process. And if we follow this process, I agree to the outcome. And if we don't follow it, then, uh, then I know the system's corrupt and you need a very simple process. And that's what randomized hierarchical representative voting, that's a mouthful. I, I, looking for better names and thinking like political playoffs or, or, you know, something like that. But it's, it's really about a bracketed system for identifying from the entire population, who's the best of the best. And instead of allowing the media and the rich and the, famous, uh, and the incumbents to determine our choices of who we can vote for. Instead of self-selecting out all the individuals, like I, I don't want to run for office. Many people, many good, decent people don't actually want to run for office because of this public spotlight it puts on you and the, the slander and the, it's, it's just terribly. And the responsibility. I mean, it's, it's a huge responsibility. Right. But it, if, if, if the governance process could be kept uh, local and in discussions of groups of 10, then there's no, you, you can't bribe people. No one's going to be there long term. Every election season, there's a different random group that you're assigned to. So you're not going to get gerrymandering and, and other things that uh, steal your ability to have influence. And you can have tremendous, good people can have tremendous influence without all the pitfalls of, of playing the politic game. Right, without pandering, without campaigning and raising tons of money. It completely changes the power dynamics and puts it back in the hands of the people. Yeah, um, let me just recap this again for the, the audience. 
So you, you divide the entire country up into small groups of 10. So you're only dealing, every, everybody can participate if they want, you don't have to participate, but you're only going to be dealing with nine other people that you have to meet with over the process of a month and pick one of you, one of, one of the 10, you included, to represent that group. And then you go to the next level, which eliminates at that point, 90% of the population. And so this 10% of the population that just uh, got basically elected to the next level, this is the playoffs, uh, does, repeats the same process where they each have to pick one of them. So uh, you have, if, if you want to be the president, you have to convince the other nine people. Uh, and then uh, you eliminate 90% of those and 90% of those, and it takes roughly eight levels to get a president, fewer levels to get uh, Congress and Senate, fewer levels than that for uh, local things, state and, and, uh, and uh, city. Uh, and so very efficient, but because it's so small, 10, 10 people, the media isn't going to spend a, a, a ton trying to influence you. Uh, they, they don't know what your discussion is, so they can't go and try and slander one person or manipulate their tweets or, uh, or, or choke off their YouTube access or take down their Wikipedia page or whatever. <laughs> I think it's yeah. so. Uh, and, you were, and you're not going to get vote corruption because when there's only 10 people casting votes at each level. Yeah. How can you corrupt a vote of 10 people? And it can all be recorded on the blockchain, verified and, and proven. And there's no possibility of somebody voting twice, uh, there's, uh, there, there's basically no possibility of voter fraud whatsoever with this system. Uh, minimal possibility, yes, yes. Okay. Particularly, yeah, it, it, it comes down to the identity problem. Can people try to participate in two groups at the same time? Uh, and, and that can largely be eliminated by having a Zoom call where everyone's on a Zoom call at the same time. They can't be on two calls with, uh, at the same time because you know, everyone's kind of verified. Are you in any other groups? No. Uh, but you can only be in one time, one With place your system time of space. identification that you've patented, uh, couldn't you make it so that the blockchain could identify when somebody's participating in two yeah. groups? Um, yeah, there's, there's, there's lots of elements. I say it's, nothing's perfect. So I don't want to present yeah. the idea that okay. it's impossible because someone will, it's someone will always find, find, find that. Yeah, it, and, and that's the thing. Nothing has to be perfect. But compared to what? Compared to what we have today? Absolutely. We've got pets and dead people voting. Uh, and we got we got mail-in voting where you can't verify it. You know, it's not who votes that counts; it's who counts the votes. And since provably honest elections are illegal, uh, you know, at least this system would actually present a means of having. This is another system for provably honest governance uh, processes. Um, yeah, you you tweeted uh, democratic voting is only meaningful if the people have a democratic process for selecting the candidates until we take control of the candidate selection from the political parties and the media, our democratic choice will, it will be an illusion, a fraud, a covert tyranny. Yes. Couldn't have said it better myself. You did say it. <laughs> and I did. <laughs> Another thing you, you said recently that I absolutely agree with, uh, perhaps it's time to end representation without taxation. And then, I, when I was talking with my producer, Dan, I said, the only thing that I would add to that is the word net. And then I, uh, he said, told me to look down in the discussion. And it, 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 you said, if you aren't paying net taxes, if you aren't paying net taxes, why should you have a vote on how the taxes are spent? And I could not agree more with this. Uh, you know, I know somebody oh. that um, if, says, if government was Michael, we have to help these people, and but uh, their their income comes from representing those people, which means their income comes from my taxes. So it's not we helping these people; <laughs> it's <laughs> somebody hiring government to point a gun at me or anybody that uh, makes more than they uh, pay, that pays more net taxes than they consume in government services. The government, uh, before this crisis, used to spend $22,000 per citizen in the United States. Now they spend about thirty-three, dollars And so if somebody isn't paying $33,000 per person, 
And so this gets to be a hefty price tag. Uh, you know, when you've got a family of four or something like that, it starts to become a very hefty thing. And people just don't realize that it's very, very few people that uh, pretty much pay for everybody else's ride. And, uh, but everybody has a vote on how much we're going to take from those people and how we're going to redistribute it. Yes. So I, I made that tweet because you know, I was thinking about the you know, American Revolution and it was all about taxation without representation. And, uh, and, uh, but I, I flipped those words around. I'm like, wait, representation without taxation is equally bad. Um, but since it's governments, if it was only just about how to allocate money, that would be the case. But government's more than about allocating money. It's about defining the judicial processes and property rights and all these other things that um, that actually mean that everyone does need to have a say in a democratic process. Um, so th that tweet was just more to highlight the, the irony of an aspect or, or the consequences of a society that allows people to vote themselves money from other people. Um, and, and that gets back into, can you have a, uh, a good government with a corrupt population? Uh, and I don't believe that is, uh, the case. And I actually believe that bad government corrupts the population. Uh, and a, a honest population can institute things that will create a good government and a good government can actually increase the virtues of, of society. And I think an element of the hierarchical representative voting is, is that it can bring out, when you're in a group of 10 people, how are you going to pick which of the 10 of you is going to represent the group? You're going to look for people who are, are persuasive, but also people who you think have integrity. And you're going to be able to judge because you look them in the eye and actually have discussions with them. Um, and so that will tend to promote people that you're going to judge based more on their virtues than based on more on their principles than uh, the memes and the platitudes and the promises that they're making when they're campaigning. So I think that the process has the potential to put more virtuous people uh, in power, they'll create more virtuous rules, and then those rules in turn will uh, be absorbed by society and increase the virtue of society. Uh, that's theoretical, you know, until we run some of these experiments, you know, we don't see how stupid people can be at corrupting things, but the, in principle, it could be a, an opportunity to restructure things. And this gets back to, you know, having a constitution that tries to limit government is a fool's errand because uh, the constitution says only gold and silver should be money. What do we have today? Right? We're not following the constitution even when it's written in plain English. Right. What matters Every is- Every day, Congress people. and the Senate pass laws. They, they spit on the constitution and completely ignore it. Uh, about probably, much great, far greater than 90% of all the laws that Congress and the Senate passes uh, are unconstitutional laws. And uh, like Ron Paul used to say, you know, what is the use of having this? Uh, if, if you want to do something that the Constitution doesn't allow, then modify the Constitution. Don't just ignore the master set of laws that all other laws are supposed to flow from. Yeah, well, and, and that's the, the challenge. You know, the Constitution's powerless to prevent or enforce itself. Only the people can enforce it. And how do the people enforce it? Well, in theory, by the people they elect. But we've seen that, you know, 70% of the people disapprove of how Congress has been operating. And it's been that way for 50 years. It's not possible for people to elect people they approve of. The system established by the Constitution for electing the parties enabled the two-party system, enabled the corruption, which enables the Constitution to be ignored. So it's more important the process for putting people in power than the actual power that they have um, because they will not respect any other document and people have no way of enforcing it other than the process of putting people in power. Uh, or I guess in theory, the second amendment, uh, but no one really wants to, to have a civil war, right? You know, the declaration of independence. Because people will tolerate a tyranny and tolerate oppression rather than risk at all. Uh, so my, my theory of, of governance is, is fundamental that by nature, it's the law of the jungle. 
and that all of our rights come from uh, entering a peace treaty with other people. Uh, and you only, and a peace treaty that's negotiated based on equal negotiation, uh, which means everything has to be reciprocal. I can't uh, give you the right to food uh, if you can't give me the right to food. And if we both, and you can only give people the right to something that you have to give. So if one of us has food and the other doesn't, you can't enter a peace treaty that says we both have a right to food, but you can enter a peace treaty that says, I will respect your rights. You can keep your property. I'll keep my property. I won't hit you. You don't hit me. We we'll use this dispute resolution process, yada, yada. You can enter fully reciprocal things, but when the playing field gets unlevel or unbalanced, it goes back to law of the jungle. Uh, and so if you don't want to go back to law of the jungle, you need to create a playing field that can self-correct uh, and and that's what I'm trying to do with the governance systems that I'm engineering, as you put it earlier. Yeah, I want to thank you for all that. It's time to wrap this up. Do you have any uh, further thoughts? Uh, and and uh, you know, you just said it again. You're engineering freedom. I just love that. Instead of fighting for it, which uh, requires conflict, you're engineering something where people can participate in freedom. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. The, I think Doug Casey said, it, people are fighting a war for dependence, right? They're, they're, they're going protesting, demanding more free stuff. Free stuff is dependence on somebody else, right? What we need is people that want independence. Independence means taking responsibility, right? What people want is freedom without responsibility, uh, which uh, is it's not really possible, right? Uh, and so that means sacrifice. That means a, a lot of paying a high price in order to have your independence. Um, but as a culture, we just want free stuff uh, and we want someone else to give it to us and we're going to protest until someone gives it to us. And at the end of the day, that's, that's like um, teenagers demanding free stuff from their parents and burning the house down until their parents give it to them. Right. It's, yep. it's, it's just uh, instead what people should be doing is creating systems that make them independent from the system. And that's where Bitcoin, cryptocurrency, gold and silver, it makes you independent of the Federal Reserve, independent of their inflation. It means decoupling yourself from, from the technology, shopping local, building and, and, and doing things local. So what we really need is a movement toward independence and personal responsibility and, and creating tools that allow people to be independent. And that's what blockchain is. It's a tool that people can use to gain some independence. Um, and, and, and so that's what I'm all about is engineering tools and systems that allow people to organize to increase their independence uh, uh, relative to the system and, and opting out rather than fighting the system and demanding the system give you stuff, demanding that Google not censor you and, and reprioritizing, demanding that they host your videos, uh, you know, demanding that you can use the bank account. All, all those things are uh, um, just creating a, a war for dependence instead of a, a war for or a opting out and becoming independent and then having your freedom that way. Uh, so our viewers can find it and read it. Uh, what is the name of the article that you wrote about the hierarchical representative government? Uh, so you, know, you can view my profile on voice, uh, voice.com. Um, count, my account is just Dan. Um, and the article's title was, um, Can We End Riots with a New Form of Government? Which now that I'm thinking about, it's probably not the, the best uh, SEO optimized I, You know, I, I want to be an ally in this. This is a brilliant thing. I want to... I, Change only happens uh, when a few people start a ball rolling. And a lot of people need to know about this. So I really hope that you take that article and rewrite it, give it a bunch of titles, give it different perspectives, uh, and just keep on republishing that same system and arguing for it. Uh, I will help. And some other time, we don't have the time here, but I want to discuss, you know, how is it, how can we get this implemented? Because uh, you're up against uh, a very entrenched system, and this is so different, uh, but it could run in parallel to start. You know, uh, you could come up with a, at least a candidate 
whether that candidate would survive the media, like a third party candidate running a, that, that was selected this way by 10 people at a time and uh, at, without any media influence and have somebody that's actually qualified <laughs> to, to be telling us what to do. I hate this thing where we have a popularity contest every four years and we hire some asshole to tell us what to do. <laughs> and right. typically they don't know anything about economics. That's my main concern because of the consequences of dumb decisions where they're not considering the economic ramifications. Um, and uh, because that always comes back to haunt us. So I wanna thank you so much and I hope we can do this again uh, sometime soon. I found this absolutely fascinating and I really want you to, I, I'm hoping that you put a lot of energy and effort behind this. I will help you. I'm sure there's a lot of viewers out there that would love to see something like this come true because we deserve more than the worst of the worst. Yes, I agree. Yeah, my, I built my, my career on building consensus algorithms for, for blockchains building consensus. This is like new consensus algorithm. And I think it's the ultimate consensus algorithm. I am very much actively pursuing this. I'm, I'm working at, on incorporating it into a book uh, so that the idea can be disseminated and, and thoroughly uh, fleshed out for, for people to understand. Uh, so I, I appreciate your support and uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to, to interview with you today. Okay, thank you very much, Dan. And to the audience, uh, uh, I hope you really got something from this. Uh, and make sure you visit Voice and take a look at EOS. Dan, thank you. Thank you, guys.